it's my pleasure to start the first course uh, developed together, Christiane Maté, my partner in this idea, and uh, it's like a dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, our course is Life Cycles of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. Uh, me and Christiane Maté started to think about this course around the, the Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Christmas and uh, start to work, uh, invite the, the speakers, uh, improve the connections. The big idea or our idea is improve the connections of research, basic epidemiological and clinical research interested in uh, Doha uh, ideas. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who is following now while I was during these six weeks. Uh, we The idea is that we talk, uh, ask, and connect our ideas around the, the Latin America and now in London too, UK, with Professor Lucila. Uh, uh, it's impressive. We are impressed because uh, we have uh, uh, around uh, 112 postgraduate students here. and. Uh, uh, 56 professors and research interested in Doha. Uh, it's, it's very, very important for us. Uh, we have uh, students of Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Uruguay, Colombia, and Guatemala. It's, it's, in, it's very, very beautiful discipline. It's our first discipline. We have today the honor to receive Professor Lucila Poston. Uh, she's president of the International Society for development origins of health and disease. Uh, I will pass uh, the coordination to Christiane, who will to introduce correctly Professor Lucila Posto. But Professor Lucila, thank you so much to stay with <laughs> us today. It's very important for our students, postgraduate, for the science, for the Latin American science. Thank you so much to stay uh, with us today. Christiane. Thank you. Very pleased, thank you. So thank you very much for your attention. We have here a really diverse group of students and we are really happy to have you here today. Uh, first of all, to, to hear Lucila. We are so honored to, to have you here, Lucila, today. So, Professor Lucila Poston is head of the School of Life Course and Population Science at King's College London. She holds the Thomas Charity Chair of Maternal and Fetal Health. She leads a multidisciplinary team of scientists and health professionals investigating the life course of health and disease. Her own research aims to improve the understanding of the short and long-term consequences of disorders in pregnancy, including obesity, gestational diabetes, and preeclampsia. Professor Poston is a fellow at Endon of the uh, Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, a National Institute of Health uh, Research Senior Investigator, and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in UK. She is a member of the UK Government's uh, Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition and President of the International Society for the Development Origins of Health and Disease. And pay attention, in 2017, Professor Poston was honored by Her Majesty the Queen with a commander of the British Empire for Services to Women's Health. So thank you very much, Dr. Lucila. Please feel free to use all the time you, you need. Thank you so much. And um, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to be here and to talk to you today. Um, for many reasons. One is that uh, the Latin American DOHAD Society is an incredibly active part of our international society for the developmental origins of health and disease, the most active of our nine regional groups. And I'd just like to thank the organisers today and indeed the, the greater LA DOHAD for all the work you're doing for our society. It's the very least I can do to come here and talk to you today because you do so much of the work of the society which is so important um so what i just like to start by talking about is is why dohad is is so important right now today where we are where we're living 
It's never been more important. We believe that the early life health is incredibly important in utero, postpartum, um, all the way through to, to adolescence in determining the health of the, the next generation of older people. There's enormous evidence to support this. And I'm, I know you, I mean, it is, it is common knowledge that uh, inadequacies in nutrition, for example, in utero and postnatally uh, will have lasting effects for the rest of one's life. And so we are in an incredibly privileged position, knowing what we do to be able to help improve public health across the world. So why is it important so now? We have a terrible situation at the moment of increasing global inequalities. Um, that means differences in income uh, are never greater than they've been at the moment across the world. It's an appalling, appalling indictment of our political situation globally, but that's what it is. In association with that, we have poor pregnancy outcomes. We know that uh, deprivation, whether it be socioeconomic deprivation, uh, environment or whatever, uh, is associated with poor pregnancy outcomes. It's associated with preterm birth, associated with uh, lo 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 low birth weight babies, associated with gestational diabetes, all of these outcomes that we are concerned with, all of which have long-term consequences for the health of the child. So we've got an increased cost of living uh, across the, the whole world at the moment. Now you've probably heard in the United Kingdom that our nurses and doctors have been on strike. We were just talking about that before we began this talk. And that's because they can't afford to eat properly at the moment on the, on the, the wages that they're given uh, because the, the cost of living is spiralling. Um, and that leads, of course, even amongst people in work, that leads to problems. And then associated with these global inequalities, we have an increasing problem of food insecurity. Uh, and um, um, of all the countries in the world or all the continents in the world, I think Latin America is, has a wonderful nu nutrition education um, re recognition worldwide. And I'm aware of, of quite a lot of the work that's been doing it. You've been doing in, in Brazil and in Chile. And it couldn't be a, a more appropriate background for you to be working in, in the Doha field. You're also extremely good at data and keeping very good databases in, in, in South America. So you're in a very privileged position to be able to look global, look at in, in, in your countries and, and to help us globally in terms of public health. Never have we been in a situation of, of, of more, more severe conflict than we, we are at the moment, at least in our, in our lifetime. Thinking about Ukraine, most recently Sudan, the Yemen, and there, the picture there is children in the Yemen, all underfed. Um, a terrible problem which has been there for several years. Afghanistan, exactly the same, where so many children now have, have very poor nutrition in early life. That's associated with stunting, it's associated with, with uh, early death, associated with infection, we all know that. This is Dohad in the living Dohad in 2023. Mental health issues are growing across the world and there's a major, a major uh, relationship between mental health issues in pregnancy and postpartum and outcomes both physical and mental. Then uh, on top of all of this, we have climate change. We have populations who are going to be having to move out of their countries because their crops are failing, leading to conflict, leading to in food insecurity again, and then the problems associated with increased temperature. We've been doing a study in, in our own unit in um, working in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, it is really very obvious to us, uh, even though we've been only working the study for about two years, that there is an increase in, in problems in terms of crops and, and, and heat. And uh, the women we've been studying are suffering because of that. So that's why just a few of the bullet points about why Dohad is so important just at the moment. So what I'm going to, first of all, tell you something, just dwell on one particular subject that I've been interested in um, and what, what we're doing something about in the UK. So this is not just in relation to low and middle income countries. In the United Kingdom, we have a huge childhood obesity problem. And the, the, the real issue about this is that it is the children from the most deprived homes who have the high, highest prevalence of obesity. This is very recent data. 
Um, so the, the, the lower arrows, the, the lower hist histograms here, 13.6, 12.9, they're children as they go into school at reception. 13.6% of our children when they first go to school are already obese. And then by the time they get to year six, which is five, five years later, 31% uh, of them are obese. And you can see that it is entirely related to deprivation. This is a major problem that we have. This is due to food insecurity. It's due to poor income. It's due to spiraling obesity in the parents. And we all know that uh, if a mother has a high BMI, then her child has a very high chance of having a high BMI as well, whatever the mechanism might be. So this is due to family environment. And it's a shocking statistic, which we are not proud of in the United Kingdom. So one of the things that I'm doing as, as president of DOHAD is to, and I've been, all day today, I've been sitting uh, on the Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition in the United Kingdom, where we've been talking about feeding from children from the ages of one to five and the prevalence of obesity. And many of our colleagues in DOHAD across the world are doing just that. We're sitting on government committees and so on to try and improve uh, the situation in our own countries. And all of you in South America are doing much the same. We have a global issue about uh, childhood obesity. Uh, we don't have an answer, uh, as unfortunately, as yet. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what DOHAD is doing, the International Society, in terms of trying to improve uh, public health globally. So at the moment, we've got about a thousand members, and, and this is a very unique society um, globally because we have members in 69 different countries, believe it or not, and 33% of our members are from low and middle income countries. And we can all learn from one another, and I think that is one of the great strengths of DOHAD, the society, in that we, we listen and we learn from one another and we share our experiences in, in many ways. And as president, I've been trying to think of many ways in which we can work better together. We don't do badly at the moment, but I think we need to work more in a more integrated way across our, our, our regional societies. So we have different um, levels of, of membership and uh, low and middle income country members uh, have uh, free membership. Um, and then the, the cost of membership declines from the, 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 the um, seniority of, of the individual who is a member. So we try and be fair. We try and make it make the society um, available to those who cannot afford to, to be members. And as you can see from the pie chart on the right, uh, a large proportion of our members belong to our nine regional groups, regional societies. Um, and a significant portion don't. And what we would like to do is to have enough regional societies for everybody to join into one so they have local and global uh, interaction. So next, just to show you where our societies are, um, we have them in Canada, we have them in a, a society in the USA, LA Dohad we've mentioned, we have one in France, we have one in Africa, we have one in Pakistan, we have one in China, we have one in Japan, and then we have a big society in New Zealand and Australia. And I'm pleased to say there that the um, indigenous population in the Philippines are going to be uh, joined, sorry, the Pacific Islanders are going to be joining in with that society soon. So a great reach. So what do we do and how do we do it? So our, our tripartite uh, aim is associated with promoting advocacy about Doha, that's uh, speaking with stakeholders, engaging with other societies. I'll give you a few examples in a minute. We want to promote research in this field and we want to promote education in this field. And uh, we've had a bit of a refresh of the society in the last year since um, 2021-22, where we're, we're really working hard at each of these three aims of the society to try and improve what we do and to have greater interaction. So just to read this out, we believe that health promotion occurs throughout the life course. Our members work to promote, ad, promote, advocate and initiate global health strategies that result in healthy futures. They engage on, in novel scientific research, exploring the biology behind a healthy start to life. So we really promote basic science. 
how our biology interacts with the environments within which we live. So we work on the social sciences and environments and geography. And how can we ensure that everyone has a healthy start to improve lifelong health? So we have, I say, more than a thousand members working in the nine, uh, in, in from, we've got 60 countries, we've got 69 countries now. So one thing we've been doing recently is uh, changing a little bit our, the, the, the management of DOHAD and appointing uh, key people onto the Council of the International Society. And most recently, in relation to the regional groups, we've just appointed Professor Shane Norris as chair of the Regional Society's subcommittee. Now, this is a new subcommittee. This is all sounds rather management speak, but actually this is really important because what we've realized is that there are lots of activities going on within the different groups and the and the rest of the groups don't know that much about them. Uh, educational activities particularly, we want to share best practice. We want to help those who wish to get some activities started and uh, and so on. This is educational advocacy. You can imagine if we get a, a really good advocacy program going between all of our, our, our uh, regional groups, we will have a global impact much greater than the individual societies doing their own thing. So Shane, who is a really great advocate for DOHAD, until recently was chair of the African DOHAD Society, he's now moved to the United Kingdom, he's working in the University of Southampton, which is where David Barker started the whole DOHAD Society off. And he's very kindly agreed to take on this role. So I don't expect um, all of you in Latin America know about this yet. We'll be announcing it soon, but it's going to be, um, I think, a great, uh, a great improvement in terms of our interaction. So I'll go through a little bit about advocacy, research and education now. So in terms of advocacy, how do we get the message across? How do we get the message across to those people who can change policy? Because this is what we want to do, and it's no easy thing to to, to change policy. I, I, you know, we do it. We try hard in the United Kingdom. It's sometimes really quite depressing how difficult it is to get across to government and to get across to local stakeholders the message of Dohad. But you know, you can succeed, and and I think um, several, and particularly LA Dohad and the UK Dohad has done pretty well recently. We can get that message across, but it just means a concerted and sustained effort to make sure that health professionals to make sure that stakeholders and government know local government national government international organizations know the message it's not a difficult message to get across we i think everybody knows that there's truth in it and every man in the street will know that there's truth in it that uh, there's nothing like having a healthy child uh, to create a, a healthy or the optimally healthy adult so we do this through our membership and I'll go through some of the things that we're doing with with our members to help advocacy uh, through our societies um, and, and so on. So just to give you one or two examples um, in terms of our membership and helping our membership uh, become individual ambassadors and advocates of Dohad. I think every one of you out there, whether you're a, pro a professor or you're, you're a, a, a junior student, you can do your bit by being an ambassador for Dohad. And I don't think most people believe how you can do that. You, you know, it's, it's not that difficult to get out there and talk about it, get small groups going, get your own network going. Social media is such a good way of, of, of distributing the message and, and all of the young people are much better at it than all of ourselves as professors. So please think about doing that, even though you think you may not uh, be in the position to do it, I assure you that you are. You can engage with others and get the message around. And there's nothing like a, a, a large number of people knowing about Dohad to get things changed. So one example, um, a few weeks ago on the 8th of March, we held a webinar for International Women's Day. And um, I put down quite a quite a substantial, substantial agenda that I thought the number of things we could get through. Well, we didn't get very far through the agenda because there was so much discussion about one or two things and particularly one thing turned up, which was talking about um, the role of uh, women in the workplace and also how these women, when they have babies, when they become pregnant, when they come back to work, how they manage at work, how much time is given off, how much paid time is provided 
how their careers are affected, and this is all of you, um, how you can carry on doing your research if you've had a child, um, and how your institution supports you. So this is, this is not directly affecting the, the, the health of, 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 the, uh, of the global population, but indirectly it absolutely is. If you cannot continue your work and continue to research and become your own advocates of Doha, then the th everything's going to go wrong for you individually. So what we found out was that there was a huge discrepancy about the way um, pregnancy and maternity leave was dealt with across globally. And we had representatives from Singapore, India, the United Kingdom, and everybody spoke up. And then we decided that what we would do, and, and Professor Deborah Sloboda is going to do this, is to put together an article to actually highlight the fact there is so much discrepancy in the way um, paternity leave is dealt with and enabling. I mean, the United States actually was one of the most, the most, the most unhelpful in terms of institutional support. Um, how we can do something about that and make a noise about it and make sure that all of you have uh, equality in terms of maternity leave and maternity support. So that's just one one example of how we've been uh, helping our membership um, help help themselves to to become advocates and to develop uh, the, the DOHAD strategy worldwide. So another thing that we can do, more the more senior people, and I hope the several professors uh, listening, is 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 and and not just at the professorial level. A lot of government committees have junior observers, uh, junior staff coming in to to provide uh, their their opinions and so on. If you get an opportunity to go onto a local government committee or a national gov government committee, or you see it in the United Kingdom, they advertise for people. It's one of the best ways of actually changing things. So. Um, I mentioned that today I've spent the whole day sitting on the Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition in the United Kingdom. And to give you an idea of what we're doing, we've been doing there, um, that committee uh, in the last few years has produced, has produced an early life nutrition report, which is all about DOHAD. I can't say that I, I was uh, intimately involved in deciding about that, but I was in terms of writing it. Feeding in the first year of life about breastfeeding, about the, the about the um, the use of formula feed and the prep, prep promotion of, of breastfeeding, the relationships with uh, with later obesity and so so on, and just what we spent all day to doing, they they is feed is the report on feeding young children aged one to five years, that's going to come out in July, that's going to be very hard hitting about the diets that children consume and particularly in relation to obesity. There's massive amount of evidence now about uh, free sugars and obesity, free sugars and dental caries. Um, we are going to make some fairly hard hitting recommendations. And the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition Report is read right across the world. So we're hoping that we will have some influence there. Then the next one that I'm it's particularly going to be involved in is the Nutrition and Maternal Health Report, where we'll be looking about pregnancy and nutrition, gestational weight gain and so on. And then also we, we're embarking on a new infant feeding survey in the United Kingdom. This used to happen, but it was stopped and we've developed a new questionnaire. So we'll get some much better data about the, uh, the way women are breastfeeding, initiation of breastfeeding, a lot more than that, quite a detailed survey uh, right across the United Kingdom. And then uh, we, we've, we're joining up uh, with uh, other uh, government uh, uh, activities, particularly the National Dietary and Nutrition Survey, OHID is one of our local government departments. And so um, that's what I do. And, and, and another DOHAD member, uh, Dr. Professor Sophie Moore, who works in the MRC in the Gambia and with us, she's on that committee too. So we, we, we're trying to infiltrate and to, to help produce the evidence base which is required. All we have to do is to show the truth about DOHAD and produce the evidence to try and persuade people that the government should change and produce policies which will aid a healthy start in life. So this is just an example of one of, of this report that was presented on uh, feeding in the first year of life. And um, this is really concerned with the rapid decline in the proportion of breastfeeding women over the first few weeks of life in the United Kingdom. It's really bad. And, and uh, it's surprisingly bad, and it's one of the worst in Europe. So that's what we're trying to promote. This is a little bit of data 
which uh, shows here the percentage of maternities initiating breastfeeding in the UK, which is only about 70 percent. And then um, the, the, the infants being fed or breastfed up to six to eight weeks is only just 48 percent now, 49 percent. So it's really poor. So that's what we're trying to change. We have a really quite a battle going on in the UK um, as to how we're going to try and influence this. And one other thing which um, some of the Doha community, a lot of us have been involved with this, Professor Keith, Keith Godfrey, who you know, um, a number of the rest of us involved, as has been done in many other countries in the, in, in the world now, in, for example, in Mexico, in the Philippines, um, having a sugar tax um, on the um, on, on sweetened beverages. And this has had a massive effect in terms of the reduction in sugar content of sugary drinks in the UK, a 36% reduction. And we are hoping that one or two studies now which are suggesting this is translating to a reduction in obesity in, in children. So um, this is the sort of thing, I and mean, this is a sort of personal example, but several members of our Doha community involved. And these are the sort of things that we can all do in terms of advocacy. And something else that we've we've become involved in in the last year, and as president of Dohad, I reached out to um, PMNCH, which is a, a global um, advocacy committee supported by the World Health Organization to improve health in women, children, and adolescents. Um, Mark Hansen, the previous president of Dohad, uh, is a member of PMNCH and um, he introduced me to this and he and I in the last couple of weeks um, have put together an application to contribute uh, uh, a short uh, a short documentary if you like about what we're doing in terms of adolescent health across some of the Doha community and we've reached out to a few people who are doing intervention studies one in Brazil actually um, and and across uh, some of the other countries in Doha, and we're going to put together this uh, small, it's a sort of lecture come, come documentary about what we're doing. So that's going to be 11th to the 12th of October in 2023, but we, we haven't been chosen now, we've, we've, we've submitted our application to do this, but I hope we will be one of the chosen groups who can talk about what they're doing in terms of adolescent health and interventions in in with adolescents and we're going to ask the adolescents themselves to speak up and talk about their involvement in in some of these studies so um we're also forging a relationship with the uh, the nutrition society of great britain which is a very large society as you all know it has uh, enormous meetings all over the world recently i think had one in in latin america and uh, we even might have uh, a, a engagement with them in the next dohad congress so we're looking for partnerships um, which can help uh, expand our, our activities and, and uh, increase the influence of, of the Doha message worldwide. So what about education? So I'm really keen on helping, um, helping young people to understand more about the Doha research and Doha uh, uh, public, health, public health message. So in the last few months, um, I've been working with some of my colleagues to develop some short courses. Our next short course is on uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence. And, and um, if you want to look on the website, you will find it there. It's in June. I think I've got a slide. My next slide is, is about that. But, but what we've done recently, um, and this again will be news to, to anybody in the Doha community because we only decided on this appointment last week at the council, we've appointed a new subcommittee chair um, to take on what we now call our professional development work. And uh, this is Dr. Isidin Aris. He's from the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard. Sorry, there's a mistake there, Harvard University. Um, he worked in, the, in Singapore on the Gusto study. He's done a lot of work in, in Dohad research and he's very keen on education and in his own university he does a lot of teaching. So I'm delighted that he is going to join us. Um, we'll be a member of council and we'll continue with uh, our expanding uh, program in teaching. So as you probably know, we have webinars. Um, we have webinars uh, every month now. We have two a month. 
short courses as i say we're going to be running them about once every three months we have what we call brain mobility awards which enable uh, two or three students a year to go to a lab of their choice and we help support their travel and accommodation we have an opportunity for workshops i think the next workshop is um, we just had an application for a workshop uh, with the anz group australia and new zealand and they will be this will be facilitating the the new relationship with the um, in the uh, Pacific Islanders and, and in, uh, welcoming them to the, to the Doha community. And then, of course, we have the International Society Conference. Um, and for members, the content of the last conference, which was in Vancouver, is available to members online. Not, lots of the lectures, not all of them. But uh, should you want to look at that, and if you are a member, you, you get access to that free. So I mentioned the, the DOHAD short courses. This is the next one, machine learning for healthcare application. Hugely trendy. Everybody wants to know about how to deal with big data. Particularly, I mean, Latin America, you have such fantastic databases. Um, certainly, um, I, I was on a committee for the Wellcome Trust where someone in Brazil got the top marks for, for one of the awards that we gave. And we'll be working on maternal uh, health and, and child health. Uh, using the, the data sets, I think, in Brazil. Um, yes, it is in Brazil. So the learning outcomes of this course, should you be interested, June the 20th to the 21st, an understanding of the most fundamental concepts and techniques of machine learning, understanding which problems can benefit from machine learning, and the feasibility of machine learning solutions. We all know this is complex statistics. Computers are, are, are able to do this. is essentially very, very upmarket modeling. Uh, statistical modeling, the ability to practically design machine learning experiments if you have big data, and the ability to apply techniques learnt to domains related to biomedical applications. And the, the, the lady who is running this, Dr. Christina Many, um, works with epidemiology. She works, on, she's been done a lot of work on COVID uh, nationally. Um, she works on the microbiome. Um, she has huge experience in the omics and, and metabolomics as well. So um, if you're interested in, in understanding how to use those big data sets in a, in a more practical way uh, with uh, AI and machine, machine learning, this is the course for you. If you're a member, you get a reduction. There's an early bird deadline. I'm not quite sure, but I don't think we've passed it yet. Uh, the main course uh, is, is graded in terms of cost, in terms of, of your seniority. So do come along if you're interested. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, our research is disseminated in several ways. One is is, is our World Congress, and, and I don't know how many of you were at the meeting in, in Vancouver. The, this meeting gave us all a most incredible headache in, in, in the development of it, in that it was de being developed during the COVID pandemic. We were terrified that nobody would be able to come. There's enormous financial implication if people can't turn up. But we went ahead. We decided that it was worth the gamble, and absolutely it was. We had more than a thousand people at the meeting. Um, it was a, in combination with with pediatrics who work in in, in the the kids' brain network in in Canada, Canada. We had a lot of interest in the indigenous Indian population and their health. And indeed, uh, as a result of that, we are forming. Uh, an EDI group, an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion group in Doha, and we are going to focus um, on Indigenous populations and what we can do for them uh, across our different uh, regional groups. It was organised by Doha Canada, who did the most fantastic job, and uh, it was a wonderful Congress. One of the issues about the Congress, any Congress, is it's very expensive to attend. I was acutely aware of this. Um, and a lot of people were not able to come because they couldn't afford it, which is why we need, as, a, as an international society, to provide educational experiences outside the Doha Congress. And that's what we're trying to do, as I've just itemised. But um, as I said, the, the content of all Congresses from now on, as much as possible, will be available online quite soon after the Congress. It's an amazing resource. All the posters are up there, that, and people have allowed us to put their posters there. Still all there. You can learn an awful lot from what was presented last August. Um, and the, some of the plenary, plenary lectures are absolutely superb. So if you want to have a look, do go online. Join us in a, as, as, as a member. It's very, very inexpensive for students. And then you have a wonderful access. And we will be increasing 
that library of, of webinars and uh, lectures uh, and all of our webinars uh, that uh, our, our speakers allow us to put on there are there and um, you'll find a wonderful resources being developed which started uh, after the Congress last year. And I should mention uh, we, we are the next Congress uh, is either going to be in Latin America or in Japan. So we've um, we, we put a tender out for the next meeting. It's going to be in 2025. We normally have the Congresses every two years, but COVID really put a kibosh on that. But we're going to uh, the next meeting will be in 2025. And um, it we now are just waiting for the full bids to come in from Latin America and Japan. And the decision will be made about which of those goes ahead for the full Congress. So, um, and I just mentioned the webinar series. We had a wonderful webinar last night um, by Professor Sebastian Bure, who's one of my idols. This this guy has um, done some fantastic work in rodent models, looking at the effect of maternal obesity on the developing brain. He's shown that leptin and ghrelin and a few other Hormones. Yesterday, his talk was about artificial sweeteners, actually, which was a bit worrying because giving obese animals, obese mothers, artificial sweeteners led to really quite profound uh, glycemic control problems in the offspring. Um, and pet that paper, if you'd like to look at it, is just out in JCI Insight. Um, very interesting, superb talk, and um, I think that one will be coming up on the on the the website quite soon. The next meeting, uh, the next one is quite soon on May the seventeenth, which is from Deb Saboda's group. Uh, Michelle Monroe Valley will be talking about unlocking the. Uh, she's not from she's not from Deb Saboda's group. Sorry, she's from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, un unlocking the secrets of strong bones investigating the intergenerational association of maternal stature on offspring's bone quantity quality. So those of you who are interested in, 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 in bone density and uh, vitamin D and so on, osteoporosis, that'll be a good talk to listen to. So please do come along um, and uh, support these, these, these webinars. They're all handpicked. Um, either people who were presenting at Vancouver who got uh, really high quality um, uh, investigator awards or international figures such as uh, Sebastian Bure. We have some excellent speakers, so look out for them. Then, of course, we have the journal, the Journal uh, of the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. We have a lot of papers from uh, Latin America. Uh, this, the impact factor is going up and up of this journal, and um, it's very ably edited by Professor Mike Ross from the United States. But do think about putting your, your DOHAD papers into this it has a good turnaround and it is um it has very eclectic papers as you can see from the titles there effects of maternal preterm birth and type 2 diabetes and uh, protein restriction during lactation disrupts the ontogenetic development of behavioral traits in male offspring uh, a lot of work animals and people all combined in one journal with some extremely good reviews so um that's as much as i want to say but you know do please enjoy your course. I'm sure it will be absolutely excellent. But while you're listening to the course and learning, thinking, think please about how you can spread the DOHAD message. Be an ambassador. Uh, think about ways you can advocate it. As I say, develop your own networks. Get the message out there. Teach the students if you're a, sen a senior person. Also, teach the students if you're not, because students can teach one another. Be a student. Be a diligent student and understand that the, the global literature. There's nothing better than a very strong literature base. When I first did my PhD, my supervisor, who was quite a strict doctor, he said, off you go to the library, Lucilla, and don't come back for three months. So that's exactly what I did. I just went and read for three months. And it's the best thing that anybody ever advised me to do because I read every aspect of what I was going to be doing. I then wrote the introduction to my thesis before I'd even done my thesis because I understood what it was about. So read, read, read and learn. And then through your research, increase the evidence base for DOHAD, make it a stronger case for uh, our stakeholders and our governments to change uh, policy because that is ultimately what we're all aiming to do. And through that, through each of those three different aims, you too can improve the health of the next generation. So enjoy the course. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the organisers. And I'm very happy to take any questions if you have time. Thank you.
Many thanks, Dr. Lucila. You have so many uh, important suggestions for the next generation of Doha investigators here. And we we have some questions here in this chat. Let Good. Yeah. <laughs> the first one is from Chris Barros. Um, she told that um, there's a new feeding program in schools in England. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, she's uh, questioning uh, why do schools have pizza menus at lunchtime? It's <laughs> real. <laughs> it's real. It's real. <laughs> well, that's a very good question. The school meals are terrible. Um, there is actually a, a, a new a new mandate out to improve, and you'll be pleased to know it is quite high in the government's agenda. In fact, I was just reading about it last week. So. The meals at the moment are not good. We have a wonderful chef called Jamie Oliver. I don't know whether you've heard about him. And he has indi individually changed the government's uh, strategy on, on school meals. So not only are we going to have better school meals, we're going to have um, school meals available for nothing for people who can't afford them. So um, every child will, every child who, who, who meets the criteria will be able to get free school meals. So that is becoming a big, a big element of, of government strategy. But the meals are, some of them are absolutely terrible. Thank you for, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> oh, thanks. No. thanks. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Here in Brazil, we have a project uh, that um, buy the, the food from the, the people that work in the field. Uh, it's from organic uh, production. Maybe right. they can they can do something like this in, in yeah. England too. Well, possibly yes. I think really what we need to do is just look at the content of the food and 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 have healthy food. It's got it actually to be said to be said it has got better in the last few years. I mean, when I was at school, it was absolutely disgusting. But but um, no, it, the, the food the food has got better, and there is there has been an effort, particularly that Jamie Oliver. But, you know, the problem was that they were having lots of carrots and things and the mothers would come along at lunchtime <laughs> and put the hamburgers through the rails of the school to hand over to the children. So we, we, we didn't have the families behind it. But, um, yeah, the ho hopefully, and I, and I hope this report coming out that we're writing at the moment, it's very hard hitting on on, on uh, some of the things that children are, are eating and particularly drinking. So, you know, I, we, we look, had a list this afternoon about where the, the percentage of calories come from in children in the UK. Number one is case, cakes and biscuits. Number two wow. is num, number two is pizzas. And I think number three was uh, yogurts and yogurts and uh, fresh, yeah, creme fraiche, which are packed full of sugar. Wow. So, you know, we, we I, I looked at it and I thought that just emphasizes that the, the sort of diet that our children are eating at the moment, it's really awful. For. So anyhow, uh, that things will hopefully improve. <laughs> oh, nice. So we have a lot of um, a lot of congratulations. Yeah, go. So nice, so nice. And we have a question from Maria Maria José Santos de Oliveira. Uh, she is asking how to promote have health education and actions uh, to eat in health in the prenatal care specifically, and also in the early childhood. Yeah. So, well, um, it's difficult. <laughs> I, 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 spent, I spent my day yesterday at Oxford University in England doing a viva of somebody's PhD. And she had been trying to change, um, to educate women in healthy behaviours. And, um, and it's very interesting. It, it didn't work really. I mean, the, the, you know, it wasn't good enough result to, to continue to a bigger study. And it's, it, she was looking at the barriers to change. And, and, and of course, there's, that's the problem um, that a lot of women say they didn't have the time to think about their own, their own food because they've got toddlers and they have a chaotic lifestyle and they have to go to work. And that's the last thing they ever think about. So time, time to concentrate on, on their food behavior is really difficult. Um, it, the best, the, there is evidence that, that a more intensive intervention is likely to work better. So they actually had quite a long um, initial meeting with the mothers antenatally, um, but a lot of them didn't have time to come to that. But um, there is, the, the problem was they couldn't come to the hospital often enough or go to the community centre because they didn't have the time to do that and they were unable to do it. So that's just an, a couple of examples about the, the issues, the practical issues that, 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 that women face. 
Um, I think personally, one thing that we do badly across the world is um, to educate our, our midwives and our nurses who look after women antenatally. In the United Kingdom, they are only taught that what is bad to eat in pregnancy. So if you ask a pregnant woman in the UK about diet in pregnancy, she will say, I shouldn't eat swordfish, I shouldn't eat liver, and I shouldn't eat unpasteurized cheese. Now, every woman who is pregnant in the United Kingdom knows that. She does not know what she should eat. And we had a long discussion about this yesterday. And I, I think um, it's not that difficult thing to achieve compared with some others in terms of, you know, what you can do in, in a country is to improve the curriculum of the health providers who are, who the, the health professionals who are working with women antenatally. Because that message certainly in the United Kingdom is not getting across and, and they don't know what the best the, the best way of, of helping people to healthy diets is. Then the question is, what is actually the advice you would give? Uh, gestational weight gain, to my mind, is 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 a really difficult issue to, to, to deal with. And I'm, I'm working on the, the guidelines for that in the UK at the moment. But a healthy diet and, and avoiding certain unhealthy foods is what every health professional should be saying in a way that it is almost targeted to the individual woman. So you need, you need to initiate a healthy conversation, a healthy behaviours conversation, but it takes time. But I do think that is one thing which is not that expensive in terms of just changing the, the, the knowledge of, of the, the health providers. But I could go on for this a very long time. Changing behaviours is very difficult. And I, um, I, mean, I mentioned the sugar tax in the UK. I am, and I know a lot of health professionals are thinking this now, that um, they, it has to be said that, that, that the commercial drive to unhealthy eating is huge. And it, they are, companies are putting a huge amount of money into marketing of unhealthy goods, unhealthy foods. Governments can't counteract that with the amount of money they've got. You know, this is incredibly well worked out. So what my opinion is that taxing unhealthy foods um, such, you know, it's, it is going to work. I think ultimately we'll find, if you ask me in 10 years time what has worked, it will be that. That, you know, we will buy, like, as we have done in the United Kingdom, making um, very high sugar containing drinks. Uh, uh, the, 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 the commercial provider has to pay a very large tax. Um, the, the cost does not really filter, doesn't necessarily filter through to the, to, to, the, to the individual. But what has happened is that there's been a 36% reduction in the sugar content of sugar sweetened beverages in the United Kingdom. And that has meant that the that, that children are drinking much less sugar. And that's been, you know, been worked out exactly how much less that is. And there's a study which was published um, a few months ago by Cambridge University showing that children at school, particularly girls, it was only girls actually, uh, were thinner. And um, we, we, this is early days yet, but uh, it only came in in 2019. But that, I, I actually think the top-down approach by government, together with tailored advice as much as possible, to uh, provided by health professionals, will be the way the way forward. It's a combination of the two and improving the obesogenic environment in other ways, and improving physical activity and so on. But it's extremely hard for people to change behaviours, change food behaviours. We all know that it's really difficult, and when you're pregnant, it's even more difficult. And where you may be motivated, but it is extremely difficult. And, and people do listen and they want good advice, uh, but uh, it's very difficult to implement. So I think a combination of the two. Other people may disagree with me, but I, certainly the feeling in the UK is this is this is really where we need to go. And I have I have the impression that uh, we have to work on the basics, like what kind of food has high content of fat, yeah, high content exactly. of carbohydrates, uh, have protein. Education. Because people don't know these basic yeah. things. So it's, it's so, really so in, the, in the UK, which is one thing that this committee that I sit on has done, is that there, there's a labelling system is now going to go on to a lot of foods, which is going to be red, green and amber. And this is going to be for each the salt content, the sugar content, the fat content um, and the protein, not the protein, sugar, salt and, sugar, salt and fat for the food product. And that is coming into to uh, now it's, it's being introduced. We've taken away um, sweets from around the, the checkouts in supermarkets. That's something else we've done. In October this year, we're stopping two for the price of one. You know, sales, and, that, and then next year, 
we're stopping advertising on television uh, when children at the time when children are watching so so we are getting somewhere i don't think our current government is adequately committed they're too they're too keen on staying in power at the moment um so it, and we have an election coming up next year it's going to be difficult to get this sort of controversial stuff through but it is gradually getting through the the public health aspect of it oh yeah thank you thank you very much we have one more question in the last minutes from Monica Guarnieri. How is the relationship with World Food Program? Is there any relationship with other initiatives? I don't know exactly what she's asking. Monica? Yeah, to... yeah the, we, we don't, but the Doha doesn't have a relationship with the World Food Program, but we certainly work with the World Health Organization and all of it. Um, so we we worked, we, we developed the childhood obesity framework program. Mark Hansen did that. We've worked with um, FIGO in terms of nutrition in pregnancy. We did a, a big review on it. So we do what we can. Um, we, we should work more with partnerships with, with, with other organizations. And as I said, we're, we're hoping to join up with the Nutrition Society, which has a big advocacy group. But I think, you know, these these organizations together should work everybody we should get together and we have a much bigger say in what happens globally it's it, it's really difficult who it's difficult to work with to be honest with you it's you know you they don't have any money to do anything so they put lots of reports out and we try and adhere to them but they don't have any way to fund implementation of them um, but they do i mean they come up with extremely sound advice and and we do have several people i say sitting on who committees and so on um, but um, the World Food Programme, no, we don't. We're not involved with that at the moment. Okay, Fabiola. Hello, Professor Lucila. Thank you so much, so much. It's very interesting discussion today. I have just one comment and one question. When Barker started the idea of Doha, he started with the intrauterine phase. And after that, the first uh, uh, neonatal phase, and after the infant, uh, infant, small children, and now we can see here the importance of Doha in actually environment, especially when you talk about the adolescent, because uh, women, adolescent. Uh, will be the next generation or yes. will be the responsible for the next generation. So uh, for us, it's very, very interesting because a lot of societies or a lot of research are related with 1,000 days, but uh, Doha, it's much more than 1,000 days. We are, and and is, this is this is a problem. One thousand days is too short, and it's you know, we we don't like it really. But we we you know it's better than nothing. So okay, we go with it sometimes. But but it isn't it isn't. It's far more than one thousand days, and I and I think what is the shift that's happened recently to to preconceptional weight. You know, it, it, it this applies to underweight as well as overweight. You know, it's extremely difficult, as you know, in in, in low middle income countries where women are often underweight before pregnancy to actually reverse that during pregnancy so you know um, protein and energy uh, supplements and so on don't really do very much to birth weight because it's too late and stunting is still a problem uh, even though so, so you know that the healthy study and, and there's been that wonderful study in, in india recently where they've uh, they did uh, nutritional supplementation from before pregnancy during pregnancy and after pregnancy and had a massive effect on on stunting hugely important study um, this is what we have to do. We, we can't do it within pregnancy. We have to start beforehand. The problem about that, I mean, they can do that in Indian because they, they've managed to recruit women when they got married because they then intended to become pregnant. You can't do that across the world. So the, the points of contact with adolescents or women intending to become pregnant are quite difficult. And that's one of the problems that we have to address. And again, this is really where I think the top down approach, which is across the whole population in terms of, of fiscal measures, is going to be more effective in, in improving preconceptional health. In fact, today I was talking to the by email with 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 the the group in Cambridge who have done the work on the sugar tax, looking at an interrupted time series and in, in terms of the effect on childhood obesity. And I said you should look at the mothers. Um, and so and so we do have maternity data sets where you have early pregnancy BMI, 
And they'll be able to do that because they've been, we've been collecting national maternity data and the BMI is not always filled in, but it'll be enough, you know, the 160,000 pregnancies or whatever. Um, but sorry, it's more than that, 600,000 pregnancies. But, but um, that, will, that, that, that might show something and that will be worth doing before and after the introduction of the sugar tax. So we can use national data like that to, to see whether th anything's happening. But um, it, it is difficult. I mean, one study I'm involved with in terms of uh, uh, women with obesity is considering whether we might even consider giving semaglutide, the weight loss drug, the GLP agonist, um, to women who are still taking contraception, so uh, long-acting contraception. I mean, this is just one idea. But, you know, it's, it is a tangible uh, population who come to have their, their, their contraception removed, but we could persuade them that, you know, because they are overweight and they may have fertility problems and so on to delay the, the removal of the contraceptive device and in the meantime take semaglutide but then we have to be very careful they continue with contraception but that's the sort of you know pharmacological approaches like that and should not be just not be thrown out of the window um yeah. and it does i mean you know type 2 diabetes now obviously semaglutide is being used considerably but it could be could be one one pharmacological way of helping. I'm not saying it's going to work. We don't know whether we're going to do it yet. But it's just a, an idea. Um, but that's what we've got to be thinking about and how we much more education in schools. I mean, you probably know about the Life Lab work in Southampton University. They have school children coming into the into the university hospital. They have a lab there. All the students in in all of the local schools go there for for several sessions, and they you know they've shown that they do learn quite a lot. Uh, in a proper, um, uh, properly tested scientific way, they do actually learn quite a lot about life course of health. And if we were to do that uh, uh, in all of our countries, actually introduce much more into the school curriculum as well as into the midwifery curriculum, we, we, we actually, I think, would have quite a big effect. So I'm, I'm all for global education, top down approaches to education as, as well as uh, local intervention. Thank you so much, Professor Lucilla, because here we have a, a lot of uh, new students post graduate. They will be our uh, next uh, professors. And uh, this idea right. that you talk today, it's very, very important, not just for us, but in the future, not just by, to Dora, but about uh, the promotion of uh, health, health in general, in different cycles of the life. Thank you so much. They're my pleasure. Thank you very much for listening and I, and I hope your course goes really well and I hope everybody, I'm sure they will, really enjoys it and think Dohad, think Dohad in all the way, everything that you do in your lives and it, when, things will happen, things will change you, believe it or not, you will be able to change things. <laughs> okay. Oh, perfect, yeah. Dr. Concila. Thank you very much. Uh, very before... nice to see you. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Goodbye for now. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you for all the all the, the yellow hands. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So before we start with the, the classes,